Okay, I think we can start. And uh, thank you for joining us, joining us at uh, ENLA today. And uh, it's our pleasure to introduce our speaker, Serkan Gugersi. He is professor in the Department of Mathematics and Division of Computational Modeling and Data Analytics at Virginia Tech. And I think the best way to identify his field of interest is describing his web page. And I'm going to read it. <laughs> My research lies in the area of model reduction whose primary goal is to replace large scale dynamical systems with lower dimensional dynamical systems, having as near as possible the same input output response characteristics as the original one. So that's uh, just perfect, <laughs> easy job. But he has published over 70, 70 papers, but nonetheless, I would like to emphasize uh, his recent milestone book, which I have on my shelf, Interpretatory Mod Methods for Model Reduction with Thanos and Tulas and Chris Bitti, uh, recently published with uh, Siam. And uh, I'm sure it's already uh, very much cited. Okay, Serkan, and uh, the title today is Rational Approximation and Data-Driven Modeling for Dynamical Systems. Please go ahead. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And then I would like to thank the committee for inviting me. It's an honor to give this talk. Also, uh, I would like to thank the committee for organizing this. For It has been for a year now. It has been uh, really spectacular. Thank you very much. As Valeria pointed out, I will talk about my research lies in the area of uh, model reduction, data-driven modeling, and I will talk about rational approximation and data-driven modeling for dynamical systems. And then input-output framework will be crucial to, to what I'm gonna talking about. There is a dynamical system, there is a forcing, and then there's an observation. Um, the part of the talk, there are parts uh, with collaborators, uh, uh, Tanas Antlas from Rice, Chris Beatty from Virginia Tech, a former student of mine at Virginia Tech, Andrea Caracciato Rodriguez, Zlatka Drumach from Zagreb, Victor Gosia from Max Planck in Magdeburg, and then a former student, Sarah Wyatt, currently in the University of State College. So there are, there are components uh, that come throughout the year with, with these collaborations. Before getting to the, uh, uh, the greedy details of the, the, the mathematics. So a, a basic illustration of where my models might be coming from. Uh, so around 2010 at Virginia Tech, we were involved, a group of us involved in um, energy efficient building hub project from the Department of Energy to, 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 to uh, reduce the energy consumptions uh, in the United States and then in, in the buildings. Um, so our goal was to, to optimal control, uh, optimal control um, in these environments. And this is the, our, I mean, we didn't call it digital twin in those days, but maybe you can think of it that way. So this is our conference room. Uh, so this conference room has, okay, table, the, the sun is shining from this direction, there are lights and then there is the vents and then there's the inlets here. So the, our goal was to simulate the indoor air velocity, temperature and moisture in this conference room. And the, the underlying the PD, that's, that's not what I wanna focus here. For me, this is, I see this as a dynamical system and a dynamical system with the input and output. And then what is the input? So here, here is inlets, there are four inlets here. The temperature of the inflow of air at all, four, at all four vents are the inputs of the dynamical system. And the observation here, we have a sensor on this max X wall over here, and then we measure the temperature there. So then, then we have a dynamical system from input to output. And then clearly there's an underlying PDE, we linearize the PDE, and then there's a finite element discretization, and that leads to this type of models that I work with. So this is, this is in most cases my starting point, but in the second part of the talk, it will be something else. So we will talk about that. So what is this? This is nothing but a linear dynamical system. Here's the dynamical equation. So the x dot is equal to, so x, x dot is equal to dx dt, clearly. And then, so this is my linear equation, the dynamical system, and here's the observation equation. So the uh, x here is the internal degrees of freedom. So this is like discretization of t. For this problem, our finite element discretization led to, led to a dimension of 200,000. And then you here, what I'm gonna call is the input 
for this problem, it is the, it is the temperature of the inflow air. And then the Y, my quantity of interest is the output and it's the temperature at the max x well. So when you look at these quantities, so E and A are N by N matrices, describe the dynamics. So these are 200,000 by 200,000 in this case. And then B and C are, are, are column vectors for this problem. So, for, um, so that's, that, that, is, that is the setup. So as you can see, I mean, this is even a small problem, 200,000, many cases that there are systems with millions of degrees of freedom, 10 millions of degrees of freedom. Even for the linear setting, if you have to simulate these things over and over again, this becomes a computational burden to the idea is to approximate this dynamical system. So starting with this large scale dynamical system with an, for a mapping from input U to output Y, our goal is arrive at this thing here, which looks exactly the same, but this R is a reduced dynamical system. So we would like to be able to go from the full model to, to reduce model. And then um, before we get there, some details about this model. So again, states, input and output. For the sake of this talk, I'm gonna focus on where the forcing and then the measurement being scalar. So these are single input, single output uh, dynamical system, but everything I talk about, and I mostly focus on multi-input, multi-input dynamical system, but for the sake of this conversation, for this talk, everything will be scalar valid here, the input and output. So some assumptions that we are going to make to make life easy that the, the um, so the eigenvalues of this matrix pencil. So if I denote them by, uh, let's say that there's a asterisk, so they are going to be in the left half play. Okay, so this is my complex domain. So what I am pretty much assuming that my dynamical system is asymptotically stable. And I'm gonna also assume for the sake of simplicity that a, the, the matrix E is non-singular. So this is an ODE, not DAE. Um, so the, the idea is if somebody gives you such a model, we would like to, we are gonna construct two subspaces, V and W. So these are bases for some, for some reduction, uh, uh, reduction spaces. So V is N by R, W is N by R. And then here is our fundamental model reduction assumption. We are assuming that our n-dimensional state approximately lives in this r-dimensional subspace. Then you take this approximation, you plug into your state equation, and then you enforce a petrochemical working condition, you end up with the reduced model. And now what are these reduced quantities? The reduced E is simply W transpose EV. Here's the reduced A, reduced B, and reduce C. So once I pick this V and W, I have my reduced model. And then as you can see, these are the reduced quantities, R by R matrices for A, R by one matrices for B and C. What is the scale that I'm talking about for this conference room example, order 200,000, when we apply, when we reduce this thing, we went down from 200,000 down to around 30, 40. That's the scale of reduction we are talking about, really uh, dramatic reduction in the, in, the, in, the, in the complexity. And then one quantity I wanna point out here, this phi. So once I pick this model reduction basis V and W, this is the underlying petrov galactic projection for the model reduction space. It is an oblique projector that, 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 is the, that, that defines the underlying model reduction process. So we are doing approximations and the goal is that when I feed the same forcing, to the full model and the reduced model, the hope is that the output of the reduced model is a good approximation of the full model. So that is, this is our goal. And then um, when I say approximately the same, so we need to measure this. And then for this linear dynamical system, the, uh, the, the complex domain, the, you just go to frequency domain is a very natural way to analyze this. As you all know that a linear dynamical system, uh, the output, is can be written simply by a convolution integral. Now, if I take the Fourier transformation of all this quantity, so U hat is the Fourier transform of the input U, Y hat is the Fourier transform of input uh, output Y. We know that convolution in the time domain becomes multiplication in the frequency domain. And these quantities here, H and HR, we call them transfer functions because they really, they map the inputs to output, they transfer to input to output 
in the uh, in the in the frequency domain. And then what are these things? These transfer functions. We can explicitly write them down uh, by just taking the Laplace integral, uh, the Laplace uh, uh, transformation of this equation. For the full model, here is the the transfer function. And similarly for the reduced model, here is the transfer function. And then these are nothing but rational functions. Okay, so this quantity is nothing but a degree and rational function in S. And then the reduced quantity, reduced transfer function is nothing but a degree R rational function in S. So I can write it in the state space form. I can write this ratio of two polynomials, or I can write this in this form, what we call the pole residue form. So these are the poles of this dynamical system. And then these are the residues. So these poles are indeed the poles of the uh, uh, general Zeigenmüller value problem with A and E. And then these are the residues. And one thing I wanna, uh, so the problem is really at this point, if you, if you wanna think about it, you can say, okay, I, I'm gonna forget about the dynamical system. Now my problem become rational approximation. Given a degree and rational function, how can I find a degree R approximation to it? And then, uh, I mean, rational approximation theory is, is a, such a rich theory. There's no way that I'm gonna do justice to everybody who worked on this area. So my perspective will be influenced by clearly what I have been working on, how I was looking at that problem, but this is a very, very rich, uh, rich, rich uh, 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 research area dating back more than hundred years ago. One thing I would like to point out here is that um, this input output behavior, these transfer functions, we call them input output invariants. Okay. So meaning that if I make a state transformation, I pick a, I pick a non-singular matrix T and then I transform my dynamics to a new basis X tilde. And if you do that, you end up with a T A, I'm sorry, uh, maybe I should not worry about writing this, but you end up with a new dynamical system in the new state space, X tilde dot is equal to T A T inverse X tilde plus T B U. And then your Y tilde is equal to C transpose T inverse X tilde. So now my, I have changed my internal dynamics. So I have a new realization, new representation with the state space representation. So A, B, C and change, but there are input out in various transfer function doesn't change. So this guy doesn't change. And then also the poles and the residues do not change. So these are, these are the things I want to work with when I do a model reduction, when I, do a, when I have an algorithm, I would like them to be in terms of the transfer function, not for a specific realization. Um, and then, so what we are going to do, uh, there are three parts. Uh, we are already 15 minutes in. Um, so I was, I think, pretty optimistic when I wrote the abstract. When I was practicing going over the slides, I realized that uh, this beautiful part that I really was hoping to go to, I will most likely won't be able to. In the part one of the talk, this is the main, the whole roadmap is this. Go from a H of S, full model, to reduced model. In part one, we will do this by projection in an intrusive way, meaning that I will have access to A, B, E, C. I have the access to the internal dynamics, and then I'm gonna do a projection to go to the reduce model. In part two, we are gonna change the tone, and then we are gonna say that we don't have access to the model. What we can do through experiment, through another ways, I can sample the underlying rational function. Then can I go to the reduced model, reduced rational function directly from the samples of the underlying transfer function? And then part three, there's a beautiful uh, framework for standard from rational approximates. I have been spending a lot of my time recently working on this thing. Um, I, if time permits or if Valeria permits, we will talk about that, but I am not too optimistic, I will get there. I can put my slides online for those who are interested or I can stick around to talk more, but I am hoping to get through first two parts. Before I start part one, are, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, there is uh, already a question, so you probably won't get to part three. So uh, Daniel <laughs> um, is asking about, uh, you can ask yourself about the projection matrices. Uh -huh. Okay, I second. Um, so is there any variant where it makes sense to choose more columns for WR than in VR? So of course not for the purpose of interpolation, but when you look back, 
So uh, here, of UG, you could just take WR to be a random matrix, and it would be a relatively good oblique projection onto the uh, a column space of VR still. Okay, so the okay, so the um, now you can choose W. So the the formulation I wrote here, the only restriction is that this is invertible. So indeed, you are free to choose a W. Uh, but um, if you choose W independent of these other quantities, that your reduced model will most likely be state dependent. It will depend on the state space realization. So that's why we are not going to choose W just independent of V. So in most cases, W is informed by the dynamics. But yeah, you can, in a way, you can do that. And then I see one more talk. Can you do pseudo inverse? Uh, that would uh, um, pseudo inverse so that you have a rectangular, uh, so then you have a state space where that your reduced quantities are no longer square, they are rectangular. So these things do show up in some settings in the DAE setting. So there are some works about that, but in, in, my, in my cases, that is, uh, I will stick with the N by uh, the WR transpose V being invertible. Okay, I hope you. I answered the question. Yes, thank you. And then yeah. there are, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a second question by Nikhil. Um, you can speak. Oh, so it's just, uh, for which S do you want the rational approximation to hold? Uh, Nikhil, just hold on to that. I will come back to that in, in, in two, three slides. Thank you. Okay, uh, that, I'll let you go on. And then I see one more question. Yeah, I think you answered that already. But, okay, okay, um, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, E doesn't have to be diagonal. I am assuming it's invertible for the sake of, for the sake of this talk, but E even does not have to be invertible. Uh, DAU problems are also okay, but there's, uh, I, will, I, will, I will not go into that in this talk, but I'm more than happy to talk about it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so part one, projection-based model reduction. So um, clearly this V and W spaces, these are, param these are, these are these parameterize all possible art or durational functions. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pick them to enforce interpolation. Interpolation of what? Interpolation of this underlying degree and rational function. And then the idea is, assume for time being that somebody gave me the interpolation points. So I have two sets of interpolation points, sigma one up to sigma r, theta one up to theta r. And then why do I pick two out of them? That is most, it might be clear to many of you. So my hr, is a degree R rational function. If you count the degrees of freedom, I have two R degrees of freedom. So I'm gonna match two R interpolation conditions. So if somebody had given me the interpolation condition, how do I construct V and W? And here it is how we construct V and W. So you construct these two matrices, we call them primitive bases. And then as you can see, these are rational curl of, uh, rational curl of uh, structure over here. So what you do, here's the first column of V, the second column of V, art column of V. And then you kind of do the dual, uh, like you, as if, as you saw the dual problem, first column of W, second column of W, art column of W. There's a cost to this. These are not cheap to evaluate. I have two R linear solves here, but this is what we have to do for optimality. And then, then you construct your reduced model via projection as as we defined before. So you get, take this VNW and then you project your reduced model, you project your dynamics. And then you guarantee that by this choice, your reduced rational function interpolates the original one at the sigma i's, at the theta i's. And so far I did not assume that these things are distinct from each other. If it turns out that some of them over, overlap, then you not only do Lagrange, the simple interpolation, but you also do Hermit interpolation. And this is the main idea of the projection-based interpolatory model reduction. Construct these two bases, and then you got your interpolatory radius model. Solve the linear systems, radius model, and then you are done. And then remember, I said that my poles were here. And then if I use circles for my interpolation points, I'm, my interpolation points are in, they don't have to be here. 
but my interpolation, I'm, I'm not gonna have that many interpolation points for only eight poles, but uh, we are gonna have interpolation points mostly in the right half plane so that they don't overlap with the poles. And in some cases, we might have interpolation points on the imaginary axis. So that's gonna be the, the patterns of the poles and then the interpolation points. Um, and then the, the back to question, where do we, uh, uh, so where do we, uh, there, there is a proof, I was gonna go through the proof, but the way that uh, this is going, I'm gonna skip the proof, the proof of this, why this is providing interpolation is pretty simple. I'm gonna skip over that. I'm gonna try to answer that question. How do we choose these interpolation points? And where do you want this model to be accurate? So there are many ways to, uh, there are different measures. And then what I've been focusing on um, uh, a lot throughout my research is something called H2 measure. Really, uh, from a complex analysis perspective, what I'm measuring, I am measuring the L2 distance between the two rational function on the imaginary axis. So I want the reduced model to be accurate in the open left half plane, a uh, right half plane, sorry. And then by the maximum modulus theorem, the worst happens on the imaginary axis. So our norm is in the defined on the imaginary axis. So I would like to minimize this least squares distance between two rational functions. And then how does this frequency measure connect to time domain measure? If I can do this, if I can minimize this least squares distance between the two rational functions, what I can guarantee is that my time domain outputs are close to each other in the L infinity sense. So there is a direct time domain interpretation for this error measure. And also this in Hilbert space, we like to work with Hilbert spaces. So how do I choose the VNW dust the interpolation points to minimize this error measure? Um, so this indeed, uh, the result goes back to 67 with modification algorithms coming from us in 2008. So that um, assume that this is the best reduced model best art order for a fixed order R, reduced model in the H2 norm. And then one can show that this reduced model is then an interpolant to the original model. Interpolant, but it's not a simple interpolant, it's an Hermit interpolant to the original model. And then where is it interpolating? It is interpolating at the mirror images of its own poles. So the optimal interpolation points are unfortunately characterized by the unknown poles of the reduced model. This is a catch-22 problem, chicken and egg problem. I want to compute the reduced model, but the optimal interpolation points depend on the reduced model. And then that's what we did in this, in the details, I don't want to spend, I only spend more than I want to spend on this slide is that you iteratively correct. So you make some selection for VNW, you look at your reduced model, you correct your interpolation points, and then you iterate until you reach the interpolation con the optimality conditions. So the Hermit interpolation is necessary condition for the optimality uh, in this uh, in this in this in this setting. So that's why it does pay off to work with this VNW because optimality requires interpolation of the uh, of the, the derivative at different points. Some works over here. So the uh, Valeria and co-authors in 2010, they looked at a greedy selection for the interpolation points. I will point those out. Uh, inspired by the uh, Trefetin's work in the CF uh, approximation, we extended these things to uh, so H infinity approximation. Um, Gutel and Baryafa, they have a RK fit framework, rational curl off. Again, the, the rational curl off set selection comes in there in this RK fit. And if you have not seen Stefan Gutel's talk at the price talk at CMCAC, highly recommend that. It says I uh, uh, definitely do that. That also talks about some kind of interpolation point selection in a similar but also different setting. Uh, Fang Banner, again, based on error estimates, some greedy selections. And then recently, Hockensen and Magruder, they um, satisfy these interpolation conditions incrementally order wise. So they made the ERCA iteration computationally much, much faster. So another important work to look at. Uh, but my measure is uh, this H2 measure. What I'm interested in, for example, how these interpolation points might be related to the, the 
the poll selection process in the in the RKFit framework. Okay, I'm already way behind the uh, what I want to say here. So the I promised connection to Celestial equation, the Cauchy matrices. Where are these things? So this interpolation basis is primitive basis V. One can easily show that yes, we can get this by solving this uh, linear systems. It satisfies this Sylvester equation. Okay, so this V can be obtained as a solution to this Sylvester equation. So here's the diagonal matrix of the interpolation points, vector of ones, and then this is the V. Similarly, W solves a dual Sylvester equation. And then this Sylvester equation framework were really uh, fundamental in extending the uh, these ideas to get some some other general settings, but uh, they are they are crucial in the interpolatory model reduction. And then, how about the Cauchy matrices? I mean, as uh, a numerical analysis, probably we are not uh, we are a little bit worried about them with their conditioning, but they show up naturally. Assume that I have choose my interpolation point sigma to be equal to theta, so I am doing Hermit interpolation. So h sigma is equal h sigma is h r sigma, but also derivative. And it turns out that the spectral decompositions of ER inverse AR, of course, you can think of it as a generalized eigenvalue decomposition. So you can write down the spectral factorization, eigen decomposition of this explicitly. So these are the poles of the reduced matrix. And the eigenvector matrix, or the inverse of it, is a Cauchy matrix formed by the choice of the interpolation points interpolated by the resulting reduced order pulse. So let me go back to this figure. I picked, I picked some interpolation points that cause some reduced order poles, and then that resulting Cauchy matrix form the uh, eigenvectors for, the, uh, for this ER inverse AR uh, in my reduced model. Why is this important? Because the condition of this Cauchy matrix and the condition of this primitive basis play a fundamental role in the perturbation analysis in interpolatory model reduction. And then two papers that uh, I am pointing this out. Um, and then you get scared about this. I mean, the Cauchy matrices are not known to be the best condition matrices. And if they are, if they are the things that, that are uh, determining the stability of your reduced model, okay, you might be worried about this. And then we said, okay, this is scary, but let's see how does the interpolation point selection affect these quantities. And then, so what we did, we took a benchmark model. This, uh, the model is an order 120. The, this is not a computationally easy to reduce model, but it is a mathematically hard to reduce model. We apply this ERCA optimal H2 iteration to reduce it. And then ERCA is an iteration. We correct V and W at every step. And then we monitor the, the condition number of this Cauchy matrix, and then the condition number of V during the ERCA iteration. So, here, uh, the three plots, R is equal to two, R is equal to 16, R is equal to 26, R is equal to two case is not interesting. So at the beginning of the iteration, I made some initial interpolation point selections, which are not optimal, which are bad. So this resulting Cauchy matrices are horribly conditioned. So these are like 10 to the 20, 10 to the 25. If the iteration proceeds, as I reach my optimal interpolation points, there is close to 15 order of magnitudes reduction in the condition number of these Cauchy matrices. And then similar things happen in the condition number of the matrix V. So interpolation points I am choosing are not optimized to minimize, are not optimized for these quantities, but somehow they are really drastically reducing them. And then I don't know why this is the case. So we started talking about this when Zlatko Durmaj, when Zlatko came to Virginia Tech for his first sabbatical in 2008. I mean, it took us 15 years to write this paper, but that, um, so um, there is this phenomenon is happening. These iterations, optimal points are aligning themselves in a such a way that it is giving us a very well conditioned Cauchy matrices and then the primitive relational curl of base spaces such that their effects on the conditioning of the resulting reduced model are much, uh, much more hand. In it. You can handle it much easily. And then, I there is a similar observation in a similar setting by Nakasukasa set and Trefetin in the AAA framework. They monitor at the end at, at the end of their AAA algorithm. Look at some Cauchy matrices. There are similar some well conditioning happening. And then this is a 
this is a mystery to me. I am still trying to understand this. And if, if somebody has any idea, I would love to. I would love to. I would love to hear about that more. Similar things happen in the context of inexexos. Um, so these V and W spaces. If I solve them, if I solve this linear system by inexexos in a petrov galerkin setting, then so this is the uh, model reduction projection based on the inexexos. So no longer the columns are by drexels. Then what you can show is that. This is like a backward error analysis. The reduced model, inexec reduced model, of course, is no longer exactly interpolating. It's an inexec solves. It not exactly interpolates, not the original model, but a perturbed model. So there is a perturbation. It's the same C, same E, same B, but now I am interpolating a nearby model. And then the perturbation is bounded by the condition of the condition number of the model reduction projection. And then the small singular values of this primitive ratio closed spaces scaled by some diagonal matrices. Um, forget about this. And then what I want to focus on this bottom plot. So what is this plot? It's another benchmark example uh, from the model reduction community. So this is something called ISS 12A model, another hard to reduce model. So this is order 1400 or so. We reduce from order seven, order zero to, or not order zero, order two to order 70. For every order, I did optimal mother reduction with ERCA, and I did mother reduction with 2,000 random selection, random interpolation points for every R. And then for overall, I have 70,000 uh, random selections. And for every case, we compare the mother reduction projection norm, which shows up in the perturbation analysis, coming from this random selections versus the optimal selections. So this is the percentage of instances where the random selection led to smaller projector norm. 0.2% in R is equal to two, point, I don't know, 4% in R is equal to eight, none nowhere else. So more than 99% of the cases, optimal interpolation points have led to smaller model reduction projector norm, which is fundamentally in important in the backward error analysis. So these are the things we have observations. We don't know exactly what's happening. Uh, and then I am hoping to get some ideas about this, uh, but uh, this optimal points that I chose from a system theoretical error, seems to have an interesting, is, is interesting interpretations from a numerical linear algebra, from a conditioning behavior as well. And then that is the end of part one. And then I'm not gonna even read the conclusions of part one. I just wanna say this, interpolation is good for you. And the ratio interpolation is even better. And then are there any, any questions uh, uh, up uh, at this point? Uh, yes, there is a question by Patrick on the inexact solves. Patrick, you should be able to speak. Yes, yes. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Yeah, it's kind of the, uh, what you showed on your last slide. Uh -huh. You mentioned that you consider inexact iterative solves in a petrov galerkin setting. I assume this means you use something like by VG. Very good. Exactly. Ex ex exactly. Exactly, so Patrick. What, so what can you say when you don't do that? So when you uh, use TMS or whatever? So I am not... Uh, so yes, we did be a by CG between V and W, absolutely. Um, I am not aware of backward error analysis when you do not use the petrov galerkin setting. That was the fundamental thing to, to get the backward error formulation, Patrick. Um, you can do still uh, forward error analysis with GMS or any, something like that, but I am not aware of... Uh, backward error formulation if you do not enforce the petrov galerkin formulation. I am not surprised um, uh, because the, it's all about the input output. When you do, when you solve VNW together, B, A, B, C, they are talking to each other. That is allowing you to give you some input output perspective. So if you just do GMRES, what will happen, Patrick, is that you will have a backward analysis maybe, but it will be a different H tilde you are interpolating for every interpolation point. That's going to depend on the interpolation point. Am I answering your question? Okay, thanks. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. No more questions so so far. So uh, carry on. Okay, okay, very good. Um, so now we are going to change gears. So now we are going to say that I don't hold my I don't have my eBay EABC matrices, but I have some input output simulation. Okay, so can I construct my reduced order quantities directly from my input output data? And for the sake of this talk. Input output data will be samples of the underlying rational function. If you give me the samples, how do I construct the uh, ER, AR, the radius quantity? And then this is classical rational interpolation or rational approximation problem. What I want to talk about is that how can I sample this in, a, um, in an experimental setting? I was lucky to collaborate uh, with colleagues here in the mechanical engineering department at Virginia Tech that have the equipments that help me to uh, have access to these measurements. So this is uh, uh, the, the, my colleague, Professor Terzaga from mechanical engineering at Virginia Tech, our PhD students, Mona Krishnan, and then these are the former members of Pablo's team. Now they are faculty members at Michigan Tech and then Tennessee Tech. So we were looking at get try to work on data-driven dispersion curve estimates. So if you are interested in look at those papers, I don't want to talk about that. What I want to talk about the measurements here. So there's a beam here. And then we would like to measure the vibrations of this beam and then in an in a input output dynamical system setting. So there is this Polytech controller. So you put this uh, piezoelectric patches on this beam and then you excite this beam. And then there are these vibrations on this. And then there is this fancy device called 3D scanning Doppler vibrometer. And then that measures the vibrations at a certain number of points on this beam. And then that's where I've been collecting or my colleagues have been collecting and giving me the data uh, for in an experimental setting. And then this is how this thing looks. So here's the beam. This is, this is really what we got data from. Like this is maybe to get certain boundary conditions. Here are the POSA materials. So these are the where we excite them maybe. And then here is this humongous device that points at this beam and then measures the vibration. So the think of it, input is the voltage and the output is the vibration. So that's my transfer function. And then, so we collect this and then you run the simulations over 10, 20 times so that you maybe try to average out the noise. And then here is an, here's an observation. So this is the, the blue is the experimental data from these beam vibrations in this frequency range. So we have 200,000 samples of the free underlying transfer function in this frequency range. So we do measure these things in real life. And then the goal is if somebody gave me these samples, how can I construct my, construct my uh, radius model directly from these samples? Any questions about this setup? No questions at the moment. Okay, so then, 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 then the, again, the problem is, so if somebody gave me somebody, no hope at part three at this point, it's even part two, finishing part two is becoming tricky now. Uh, so um, now the given the samples, how do I get this radius models? Really, um, things are hidden and we are gonna use this projection to, to, to reveal what's happening. So if I, let's go back, let's take a step back. Remember, this was our projection-based model. This was our V, this was our W. So now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna look at the i chat entry of the reduced mat reduce matrix ER. So I take my ER, multiply by the clinical mat matrix from left and right. Okay, so this is the ER transpose WR directly from here. This is the i column of V directly from here. And then what I do, I do very simple manipulation. This is E. And here's a very, very fancy way of writing what E is. Subtract A, sub multiply by theta A, and then divide by theta minus sigma. That is just a fancy way of writing A. And then you multiply this out. This cancels that. This cancels that. All of a sudden, I chain entry of this E matrix becomes this. And if you look at this, to write down this entry, I don't need anything. I don't need A, I don't need B, I don't need C. If I have my samples, I can write down the entries of this radius E directly. Similarly, you do the same analysis for AR. 
Same thing, left hand just uh, multiplied by EI and EJ. And then this is the I chain entry of A. Again, if I had the data and the interpolation points, I can directly write it down from data. Similarly, B, similarly, C. And then this is where you get your interpolatory reduced model in the state space fashion directly from data. And then this is what we call the learner framework for data driven modeling, despite this, this fundamental work by Mayo and Antolas 2007. How to write these quantities directly from data. These matrices, L and M, so the, the matrix that shows up here in A, shows up here in, in E, uh, E and A. Uh, these are called, this is the learner matrix. And then this is the, we call the shifted learner matrix. And as you can see, this is a divided difference matrix related to the transfer function H of S. And this is very thick. I should go to this one. So this is related to the transfer function H of S. And then this is somehow related to S times H of S. So that's why we call this the uh, learner. And then this is like a shift in the discrete time. There's details I'm gonna skip. But so these are fundamental quantities in this interpolatory radius models from data. And then the Sylvester equations come back. So this learner matrices are, are indeed solution to these Sylvester equations. These are the interpolation points, vector of ones, and then C and B have contained the data. So again, fundamentally, the Sylvester equations are showing up not only in projection-based model reduction, but also data-driven model reduction. And then the Sylvester equations have been used, that has been in a very, very impressive recent work to look at this learner matrices, the Sylvester equation, to give ideas about how the, their single values decay, they are about their pseudo spectra, how their, how their eigenvalues and eigenvectors behave. So I highly recommend to look into those details, which, which to, to, look, to get these papers, which give a lot of uh, information about the uh, pseudo spectra, the single value decays of these learner matrices. In the example I show you, we had like 200,000 data points. Clearly, you don't want to interpolate 200,000 points. Yeah, you have more than enough data, you just take the SVD and then you truncate it, okay? And then, so that's the usual, our, our friend SVD. As I always tell my students, if you don't know what to do with the matrix, take it to SVD. So you do something like this here, you take the SVD to, to kind of uh, nail it, uh, uh, redundant data. And what is this importance of learner matrix? So this learner matrix has a fundamental property. Let me take this transfer, let me take this transfer function. This might look like an order of five rational, degree five rational function, but I picked it in a such a way that there is a stable pole zero cancellation. So indeed, minimal degree is order four. I sample this at 20 points. And then these are the normalized singular values of this learner matrix. And then what you see is that you have one, two, three, four non-zero singular values. And after the fifth one, you are at the machine precision. So what it is saying is that if you have sampled a rational function, and if you form the divided difference matrix from that, the learner matrix, the rank of the learner matrix, recover the underlying, we call this Macmillan degree, the Macmillan degree of the underlying rational function. I was just recently informed by Thanos that this fact is indeed was known to Lerner in his paper in 1934. Um, it, became more, uh, it, it became more prominent in the 80s and then came back in 2000, but that is fundamentally important for us. And then this will come back in, the, in, the, in the, what I'm about to talk about the balanced truncation next. So, so again, the rank of the learner matrix, it really codes the complexity of the function that you are sampling. This is a good place to stop. Any questions about that? Uh, yeah, there's a question. Uh, let me just unmute uh, Ilse. Uh, Ilse Ibsen, I think you should. Yeah, uh, be... yeah. Um, Zakhar, I wanted to know whether if you have too many data, whether you can replace the SVD by subset selection. So you, you know what, which data points you selected rather than mashing them up uh, through an oh, SVD. Very, okay, that's, that's a, okay. Uh, that's a really great question, uh, Ilza. So, Ilza, if the, um, there is a recent work by, work by uh, Antulas uh, Gosea, uh, 
And then it is also part of it is also in our book uh, with Thanos, uh, Chris, and myself in, 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 the, in this book uh, is that uh, if the truncation is exact, uh, indeed, you can say that this truncated model is interpolating at this different interpolation point. So you can indeed connect the truncated set to the new sets of interpolation points. But if the truncation is, is not exact, I am not sure whether you can tell exactly what the interpolation points are for the new trunc uh, for the by the SPD based truncation. Maybe the recent paper by Thanos and Victor has answers it. I am not sure about that. Okay. Uh, so there is another question by uh, Alessandro Aya. I just have to uh, unmute as you can ask yourself. Ask it yourself, Alessandro. Okay. Hi, Serkan. Uh, Hi, Alessandro. I have a question. So you you, you assume that your, your data fits a uh, linear model, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So how, how do you know that? I mean, how do, how do you know that it's true? OK, so uh, I don't know that. <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, uh, Alessandro, um, so the, for the sake of this talk, I, I did a lot of simplifications. And then the uh, fundamental simplification I made here is that I am working with the linear dynamical systems. Over the last four or five years, uh, there is a lot of work uh, from our group, from Peter Banner's group, from the from Antolas, from Gosea, from other, to extending these interpolation techniques to uh, nonlinear nonlinear models. So you go from a single transfer function to a sequence of multiple transfer function using the concept of Walter series expansion. Then many of the concepts I studied here has been extended to the nonlinear setting. So you can talk about inter interpolating a sequence of transfer functions corresponding to a nonlinear model. Another answer is that when, I, when you do a control, usually you are trying to control your uh, dynamics around an equilibrium point. Then around an equilibrium point, your system might behave like a linear model. That's why in that setting, it is okay that you're approximating, uh, approximating, a, uh, approximating a linear model. Is it, am I answering your okay. question, Alessandro? Uh, yeah, somehow, yes. I mean, uh, and also if, if you have a, if you have yeah. a nonlinear uh, non part, I mean, you, you also have to have an assumption about your model, it's totally general. And then I stop with questions, sorry. Uh, do I have to make an assumption about what? About your model that you want to fit. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So the so far the, the techniques have been extended to the nonlinear settings where the let me go here. Let me just write here. So right now I have x dot is equal to a x plus b u, right? So mm -hmm. we can do quadratic nonlinearity, which covers a lot of settings. Indeed, a recent work by Peter Benner, Pavan Goyal, and Igor Duff. Ponte stuff, it even added to, it even extended this to polynomial nonlinearity. So we really have a wide range of nonlinear models that we can do the fitting. Things get tricky. I am not, I don't want to say that the theory is as a result of the linear case. I am definitely not claiming that. Please do not get me wrong. But there is a lot of work which handles the important nonlinear problems using the interpolation theory or even the balance truncation using ideas from systems theory. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> I actually had a similar question. Sorry to stop you. So when Go you're ahead. trying to fit in a linear model, will will there be something in your algorithm that tells you that you shouldn't actually fit a linear model, that your assumptions are somehow wrong? Will there be some some uh -huh. indicator? So okay, maybe maybe I should make one clarification here uh, that it is uh, this is not answering the linear nonlinear question, Melina, but it's mm -hmm. answering another question. So my derivation of er here. Assume that I started from E, A, B, C, okay? But this result, this interpolation result is correct as long as whatever this H does not have to come from a rational function, okay? So for example, this H could be, uh, I mean, it could have a delay in it, okay? So it could be C transpose, A, C minus E to the minus T, S, A inverse B. 
Okay, so the first thing is that underlying model doesn't have to be rational. The proof is so much easier if it's come from rational. Underlying model might have structures, it could have internal delay, it could have second order. So it could be linear in dynamics, but it could be nonlinear in frequency. So that is, that is not a problem. So now the linear versus nonlinear dynamics. So you are doing a least squares fit. Uh, so, and then if you are not able to fit this thing, uh, that might give you an idea about something is missing. But in, um, another thing is that uh, you might add a correction term. Like there is a, there are works by, uh, I, I, I did not anticipate this, um, um, Perestorfer. Um, I forgot the Benjamin's work, which year? Uh, He's here, he can probably. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, that maybe, maybe you learn the reduced model and then maybe this is not good enough and then you can add a correction. Mm -hmm. I mean, I okay. am not necessarily, this is not a proper representation of the Benjamin's work, but if I learn the radius model, I can add a correction term maybe um, to, in this case, there's a time domain data. So mm -hmm. you can add that corrections maybe afterwards. But in many cases, when I work my my colleagues that from an underlying physics, Melina, we have some ideas. Like okay. we have some ideas that there is a quadratic structure. There is mm -hmm. this structure. And then we do use this structure in the model. Okay, um, I let you carry on, and uh, we we leave other questions to later. Okay, and I think I might have casually answered without realizing we let them questions about the structure preserving uh, uh, modeling in this framework. Yeah. So so now um, I, I'm going to skip this. I don't at this point. I don't have time. I mean, I am so I was so optimistic I was going to go through part three too, but yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, so now I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to go back to a, one of the golden model reduction tools in control theory called balanced truncation, which is projection based. Okay. So, and our goal will be to make balanced truncation non projection based, implement balanced truncation from data. So, the, our framework, either we have this model or the transfer function, they are the same thing. You solve these two Lyapunov equations. Again, remember the assumption e is non singular. Eigenvalues of the system is in the left, uh, in the uh, where this left half plane. So I think totally stable. So these things have unique positive definite solutions uh, under some minimality assumptions. So you solve this Lyapunov of equations for P and Q. And then again, the uh, this numerical algebra plays a fundamental role here. So this P and this P and Q are really at the core of system theoretical model reduction. These are called Gramians. P is called the reachability gramian. And it tells you about, if you look at the state equation, assume that you are simulating this dynamic, you are at the initial condition zero. And then you wanna drive your system from zero state to some non-zero state by varying the input. How easy to reach this non-zero state? That information hidden in the reachability gramian P. And the observability gramian, on the other end, observability gramian does not care about the uh, does not care about the input part. Observability gramian, you have an unforced dynamical system, u is equal to zero. You pick an initial condition, so there is no u term. You pick an initial condition. You simulate this dynamical system. How much energy this initial condition is contributing to the output, and then that information is hidden in the observability gramming. And then what the balanced truncation does is that you kind of try to keep the states which are easy to reach and easy to observe. It, I don't want to go into those the details, but these are really fundamental quantities. And then one thing I want to mention is that this P and Q are state dependent. If I change my state space, P and Q change. However, there are some invariants called Hankel singular values, which are the square root of the eigenvalues of P times Q. These things are input output invariants of this dynamical system. It doesn't matter what state space I use, the P and Q might change, but my Hankel singular values are always fixed. And then let's go back to that previous example. I had this degree five rational function. It was degree four indeed. This was the learner rank, which was four. 
If you compute the Hankel singular values, as with the learner rank, you are going to have four non-zero Hankel singular value, and then the fifth one will be zero. So the, this Hankel singular values also encodes the underlying minimal degree. And then that has a really good connection to learner that we are going to, which I will hopefully make in the next five minutes. So the balanced truncation is this spectacular model reduction technique, construct a reduced model by eliminating the states corresponding the small singular values, like in the SVD based optimal approximation. It's not exactly that, but it's related to. So for example, if you look at this dynamical system, okay, this is zero, I can drop this. This is much smaller, I can drop this. Maybe I can go from order four to order three without losing much accuracy. And when you do that, you have an a priori error estimate. The sum of the truncated Hankel singular values multiplied by two gives you an, an error bound now for the L2 norm of the mismatch in the output. How does this algorithm work? Given the system, A, B, C, D. So you start by solving these Lyapunov equations, okay? Um, and then you don't need to solve for P indeed. What you need to do, you need to solve for the square root, fact, square root factors for, uh, for P and Q. And then like this is, uh, I should have written this here, Hammerling 82. Hammerling showed us how can I solve for the square root factors without knowing, without knowing that, um, uh, that without knowing P, okay? Anyhow, so once you get this UNL, you construct this matrix, you take the SVD of this matrix, and then here's your model reduction basis. Again, get the UNL, construct this L transpose EU, and then here's your model reduction basis, reduced E, reduced A, reduced P, reduced C from balanced truncation. If you multiply this out, here are these orange are the quantities that balanced truncation has to construct. I need to construct L and U, and I need to construct these five quantities. And then what we will do, if I can do it in the two minutes, what we are gonna show is that we can construct these, take, these quantities directly from transfer function values. Uh, so of course, getting this UNL are not really feasible. It says these are hard to solve. You do, you do large scale solves, you do approximate low rank factors. So many, I hope that many of this, uh, I am not, I am skipping, I'm sure I'm skipping many people who really contributed drastically to dramatic, uh, to get these approximations, but really what you do, you get this approximate low rank factors, and then you replace the exec UNL with the approximate UNL. Um, so what we are gonna do here is related to something that Kerry and Lucas and Perry had in 2002, balanced POD. We are gonna do quadrature-based approximation to do this. I am, as I always do, I am really, so we are gonna be done in two minutes. Melina, is that the case? Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, should, we should be wrapping up soon. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, then it's, it's gonna be sad that I'm not gonna be able to go through even this thing. So that Grammy and P, uh, you can write this in the frequency domain. And then this is a numerical integral. And then we can throw a numerical quadrature on this, okay? So whatever numerical quadrature you choose, so these are your quadrature weights, these are your quadrature nodes, and then you might have some nodes at infinity. And then when you take this thing, you can define this factor U such that this P, is nothing but U, U transpose. And then the, this Q is nothing but L, L transpose. And now what I wanna emphasize here is that in the balanced truncation, we don't need U and L separately. We need this L transpose EU. And then what we showed is that inspired by an underlying numerical quadrature, this quantity that balanced truncation needs does not need L, does not need U, you can construct an approximation to that directly from transfer function samples. So the SVD of this matrix, which you can directly get from transfer functions, will give you an approximation to Hankel singular values. And then that is the example that does this. So the circles are the true Hankel singular values. These are the approximate Hankel singular values. 
by just using transfer function samples, we are able to nail them. And then I'm going to take one more minute. No, so there... sir, can, sir can try to okay. conclude. Okay. okay, then I'll stop here. Then the, the, I think it's the... the best place to stop. And I also okay. like your imaginary unit very much. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I'll stop here and I apologize is that... Uh... No problem. It's just that uh, we allow for more questions, if any. Okay. Okay, there... Um... There is one. Uh, there are a couple of questions. What we, what I'll do, I'll, I'll let uh, one be asked, and then we close the YouTube and we leave the meeting open for more questions. So um, let me. Uh, so Nikhil has another question. So I'm um, trying to unmute him. Oh, he should be able to talk now. Uh, hi. Uh, so, so in in part one of the talk, uh, you mentioned that. For algorithms like uh, you know ERCA or AAA, the con the condition numbers of these relevant matrices go down over the over the iterations. Mm -hmm. uh, do you is there a continuous time al algorithm uh, for which you expect the same thing to happen? So I mean, is there a flow on the interpolation points for which you you expect these condition numbers to decrease? Okay, so this is a, a continuous time algorithm. Is that what you said, Nikhil? Yeah, like is there a flow on the interpolation okay. points? So I would, um, I would, I don't know if Zlatko is, uh, I don't know if Zlatko is right now uh, here. Um, so, <laughs> okay, Zlatko, I don't know whether you wanna uh, take, take it, uh, you wanna answer this. So the, uh, so right now, uh, what we are looking at this um, um, movement of the interpolation point is if like a discrete time dynamical systems. Okay, and then mm -hmm. can we say something about how these, how these things are moving? So that is something that Zlatka has been looking at. I don't know whether he has something to share, but that's something that-, uh, uh, that I have no progress so far, but some things can be done if you consider these as a dynamical system and then apply basically, uh, what, what I've been looking for uh, is a, a treat them as a dynamical system and apply some of this Koopman theory to it. So that's the idea. But uh, at, at the time we were looking at that, I, I, if I remember correctly, we were trying to make some connection with, uh, with uh, potential theory and orthogonal polynomials and so on. So uh, there is something in it, but right now I don't have any, any definite answer. And then Nikki, one thing that I'm really interested in that of the final distribution of these points, what do they represent? So the Chris PT has okay. been thinking about some constant condensed distribution. There are some connections, but we don't have an answer to that. But okay. you can really think of the discrete dynamical system map. Okay, thank you, Serkan. Uh, so people are uh, really, uh, uh, really, are really asking for your part three and whether you would be able to uh, give it to us so that we can. Absol post of it course, on absolutely, our absolutely, 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 absolutely. At least two or th three people asking yeah. for the part three. Okay. So, and uh, I, I, Melody, I am questions. really. I am really sorry for for running over time. Well, very, very very interesting stuff. So <laughs> yeah, it's 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 nice to have the questions also in between. So so very interesting and very uh, exciting and entertaining talk. So uh, um, energetic talk. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, we have no more questions on uh, on the chat on the Zoom chat so far. Uh, Jörg, are you monitoring? No, no, no. Yeah, I'm monitoring YouTube, but there's no question. So okay, what I so, uh, shall I put the um, our uh, slide for next? Um, yes, mm -hmm. and then we and just uh, keep maybe we'll, uh, we we'll, uh, we keep the meeting uh, open for uh, yeah. Okay, so that our so while I thank all the audience to uh, stay here with us, I will I, I remind you that the next talk will be uh, in two weeks, uh, Madeleine Udell again at 4 p.m. Um, European uh, summertime. And then this will be our last talk for the spring uh, before the summer conference period begins with the Science Applied Inner Algebra Conference, for instance, and many other conferences. And we'll most likely resume during the fall semester, which means that uh, uh, some of us wanted to uh, start even earlier. So who knows? <laughs> So we'll, uh, we'll be very um, pleased to see you again with us uh, once we start again. 
Okay, so thank you uh, all of you. I think uh, thanks to all of you and who stays. Let's enjoy our chats now.